Um, so I'm really uh, wanted to begin by saying that uh, when we are really talking about um, Operation 5050, it really is more about uh, the story of, you know, why did we feel this urgency during COVID-19 to really take a moment and say, you know, right now we want to make sure that women's perspectives and women's perspectives from diverse backgrounds are really part of uh, the decision making, the discussions uh, of COVID-19. And uh, many times, you know, during a uh, emergency and especially when it, there is something to the scale that we're seeing now, there is a tend tendency to say uh, right now is not the time for women. Right now is not the time for diversity and inclusion. And so we really want to, you know, as women in global health, really focus on saying that right now is exactly the time. If it's not this pandemic, then which pandemic will we be talking about diversity, inclusion, equity? Um, and we know that uh, the hardest hit people are going to be people from those backgrounds. And uh, we cannot design solutions if we don't have the best minds um, in the same room, on the same decision making tables. And this is very much about uh, creating a smarter, uh, global health. Um, so really wanted to open it up with that frame and I'm going to technically uh, try to share my screen. So give me one second as I do this. Okay, and Um, so again, uh, Carmen already introduced me, but in case you didn't catch my name, I'm uh, Rupa Dot, and I serve as the Executive Director of Women in Global Health, but I also am a practicing physician here in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, so some of the numbers that, that uh, I hope all of you already know, but I think it's always uh, critical that we have the facts right. Global health is uh, delivered by women, but led by men. So when we take a look at global health leadership, nearly 70% of the workforce are women. But when you take a look at senior roles, those roles are um, occupied, um, only 25% of those roles are occupied by women. And then when you actually look at the most senior leadership, which is um, in the private sector, uh, only less than 5% of Fortune 500 companies have women as CEOs. And what's really interesting is if you go a step further, and I know that's, the, that's how this group exactly looks at things, is that gender is one dimension, but we really need to use what's called an intersectionality approach, looking at background, uh, race, ethnicity, caste, socioeconomic status, disability, um, age. So there's many different ways to divide up representation and ensuring diversity. So particularly, taking a look at um, from a power privilege lens, uh, the representation of lower middle income countries um, and decision-making people from those backgrounds. What we can say is that uh, based on the Global Health 5050 report in 2020, uh, the numbers are quite stark that only um, out of all of those uh, 190 plus organizations mapped by Global Health 5050, women from lower middle income countries occupy less than 5% of leadership opportunities in all of those organizations. And when you contrast that with the fact that more than 80% of um, the world's population is based in LMIC um, and in global health, that is uh, you know, the, the perceived area where we're doing majority of our work, the imbalance in, gen in, in gender is great, but the imbalance in even representation from LMIC is, is a really massive one. Um, and so very briefly, Women in Global Health, we are a global movement, a network of women and allies from all geographies. Uh, we are a platform for all voices. Um, so really the voices and visibility of those affected by in inequity are the ones that we really want to make sure are represented. We consider ourselves a catalytic force. So our, our purpose is really to um, leverage the power and influence of existing existing entities, existing individuals to really drive the change. And we see ourselves as a strategic disruptor. Uh, so for our, our role, we want to challenge power and privilege, but specifically in a very constructive way to really ensure that we are uh, advancing gender equity and uh, achieving health um, equity in the process as well. And much more about the conversation around systems and structures and less about fixing individuals. Um, so our movement, um, Sarah will talk a little bit more about our chapters, um, but just wanted to really highlight that uh, we in the last um, five years uh, were also very, very much all volunteer led and just this is our first year that we have formal staff, but all of this has been fueled by interest and demand all around the world that gender equity is a critical issue, but more importantly, diversity and inclusion. So what you guys have put together in Switzerland um, in the past year, two years, I'm really impressed by the community you have 
happened. Uh, and just know that there is solidarity globally uh, with women in global health and what you are, what you all are doing. Um, and so a little bit about the, you know, diving in specifically to COVID-19. We know that global health security depends on women. They are the frontline uh, workforce in many countries. Um, uh, patients are, and communities are only going to encounter women providers. Uh, some of the response in places like China um, have shown that 90% of the workforce responding to COVID-19 has been women. Uh, and then in relation to that, we really felt that uh, when we are recognizing women's contributions, that it's uh, important that we contextualize it into a gender responsive approach. And what we have um, focused as our five ask campaign is really ensuring that there is equal representation, which is what Operation 5050 is about. Uh, but some of the other things that really to contextualize um, gender equality is that we are advocating for safe and decent work conditions. We know that health work workers um, are facing uh, working environments where they don't have appropriate physical protective equipment. A lot of their work is unpaid, underpaid, uh, and this is uh, women that are also having added care responsibilities. So we really want to make sure that there's safe and decent work that also is being created, acknowledging that these are women working in the health system. Um, the fair pay and shared um, unpaid work, especially in a pandemic or health emergency, the unpaid work um, goes up especially for women. Women are more likely to be in informal sectors. They're also taking care of um, family um, a lot more based on existing gender uh, roles. And so we see that there is a, a critical need to recognize the unpaid work that's happening in the household, but also the unpaid work that's happening in the health and social sector, which is nearly 50% of what women do in this sector. And then fourthly, really around uh, gender responsive approaches. And this is really making sure that we're disaggregating data by gender um, and sex, and we're also being very uh, mindful of the fact that, that there are gender determinants of health and access issues and what, what uh, services are considered essential or not, and really to make sure that we reflect deeply on issues such as especially uh, you know, looking at family planning being disrupted, access to sexually protective health uh, rights and services are really critical. And then finally, really well-funded organizations that are um, led by women, uh, our women's movements, um, our grassroots, especially in the global south, are things that we're advocating for because we know these groups are providing social protections um, and leadership, but the way that they operate, um, as you guys are also a movement, that resources are rarely um, allocated to this type of work, but it is critical work into uh, building community resilience. Um, so this is where Operation 5050 uh, really fits into. And as I mentioned in our my opening remarks, what inspired Operation 5050 was really that in um, in early February and um, in that early period, we started realizing once um, the discussion of COVID-19 being a, a health emergency and, and the pandemic was announced on March 11th, but even in that first month, who was talking about the health emergency, who was getting cited in media, who was actually getting to shape um, the, the discussion um, at the national level and at the global level, we really saw a gender gap. Uh, some of those early numbers in that first month, a quick snapshot analysis looking at media citations showed that women were being cited um, uh, for every time uh, men were cited three times to every um, three to one ratio. So women were cited um, much less, um, nearly uh, four times less than men were. And then when we also take, took a really cursory look at um, uh, composition by gender um, of task teams that were quite prominent in, in the global space, we noticed that women were making up less than 20% of any of the global task teams. So some of the big ones that I'd like to mention is um, WHO's very first um, uh, WHO emergency committee on COVID-19, which was formed in um, February, only had about 20% women in it. The WHO Joint Commission going to China had 16% women. So in that case, the Chinese government had um, critical say in who was represented and had very little women as well. And then looking in, in the United States, just as a national example, the very first task team that was created was all men. Uh, two days later, um, they 
they added two women and that's when the por uh, proportion got to 10%. Um, and now uh, I don't have a graphic to demonstrate this, but we just did a recent mapping of nearly 30 countries. Uh, some of the things that our group has found in partnership with many of the other researchers looking at this is that there's a lack of transparency in task teams. It's very difficult to get the data on who is actually leading the decision making. Um, secondly, uh, when we were able to get that data, the representation was very consistent to 20% of task teams um, have women in that. Um, and then when we, uh, when our colleagues um, that uh, looked into the task team from a different lens um, also acknowledged that the composition doesn't include health worker perspectives, uh, does not include community voices. Um, it is uh, often very limited to a certain type of um, profile, which is usually an epidemiologist, a virologist, um, and not really acknowledging um, that a pandemic to the scale really needs community engagement. So when we talk about diversity and inclusion for us, it is also the diversity and what type of stakeholders and what perspectives they're bringing. Um, and so why it matters is that we know that gender inclusive and diverse decision making um, is not only the right thing to do, but it leads to better health outcomes. We wrote a article in B, uh, BMJ, which um, really talked about the fact that there is a gender dividend, a health dividend and a development dividend. Uh, and I'm sharing this not because I don't know that you guys truly believe in this. That's why your title of your organization um, is, is named that way. And this is your mission as much as ours, um, but really sharing that for Operation 5050, we have had to use this framing really to make a case of why it matters and how it leads to more resilience and stronger health systems. Um, and we have gone beyond the health and development way of looking at it and said that, you know, this is also about innovation. It's also about knowledge and about a, an effective and ethical response. And um, we're happy to share the paper if there's of interest, it is open access. Uh, but this is, you know, the way that we've been talking about Operation 5050. Um, and, and and some of the other things I'd like to highlight about Operation 5050 is that uh, really, you know, creating a tool such as a list, um, it, you know, might not seem like the most effective way to take on this biggest, big, big issue of uh, inclusion in the space. But what we found is that the number one ex uh, excuse, I would say, that we hear what, why there isn't diversity, both from a gender perspective and from a uh, global LMIC, is that we don't know who the people are. We, we can't identify identify them. And uh, women in global health, when we started, we were really inspired already by a list project that uh, Professor Elena Cook Bush had put together called uh, hashtag WGH100, which is meant to be here are 100 names of women in global health. So you no longer have an excuse for an all male panel or an all male committee. And so what we wanted to do with Operation 5050 is say, here's a list of at least 100 people from all around the world. We linked up with um, a group uh, that is called um, uh, WCAPS uh, Net, which really focuses on bringing perspectives of women um, of of color uh, that are working in peace and um, health security and uh, security overall to really make sure that our list was not only uh, an open source list uh, that by default we were hoping for uh, diversity, but we deliberately partnered with an organization that is committed to diversity as their core area of work to ensure that that list would be as close to being uh, uh, more diverse. And we, we're really glad to say that at least 40% of the list is from people people from LMIC being included. We know that this is still um, not the number we want to reach, but it is a work in progress. And this list has been used by media. It has also been used um, uh, locally um, in, in national committees, but we still want to do more with this list. And um, I know this is just the start of more and uh, look forward to being able to connect with all of you. Thank you. Great, thank you. Well, I hope everyone, well, I guess by now you appreciate how lucky we are to have them on board today. Thank you, Rupa. This has been really a fantastic compilation of your work during the last five years. I must say that if you follow the organization, you will be also astonished how much you reach being on a voluntary basis. So yeah, thank you. And so with, with that, let's move on to our panel. I think Rupa has set the stage for, for a great discussion. So. Without further ado, let me introduce our other four speakers. First, we will have Sarah Hilwer, who, as I, as I was saying at the beginning, she's the Deputy Director of Women in Global Health. 
She is also an award-winning social entrepreneur, global health strategist, and advocate for girls and women. Together with Sarah and Rupa, we will have Margaret Yefong. She is a medical anthropologist by training, but she's also the director of the Institute of Health Research at the University of Health and Allied Sciences in Ghana. And I must also say that we're lucky to say that she is also a member of our external review board here at Swiss TPH and a Swiss TPH alumni. Welcome, Margaret. Thank you. Well, um, <laughs> welcome. Following Margaret, we will also have Fredo Zokumu. He is the director of science at the Fakara Health Institute in Tanzania. Since 2008, he has been studying human mosquito interactions and developing new techniques to complement existing malaria interventions and accelerate efforts towards elimination. He was named top 100 of global thinkers, and he's also a passionate advocate for science in Africa. So welcome, Fredgers. And last, but definitely not least, I'm very glad to introduce Afrini Jamir. She is a medical microbiologist and is currently working as a laboratory coordinator at the National Institute of Health in Pakistan. She has been working in the National Action Plan on antimicrobial surveillance in Pakistan, but more recently she has been coordinating efforts to, to improve the testing response of COVID-19 in Pakistan. So as you see, we have a, an absolutely brilliant panel, panel, and I'm really, really happy to welcome the five of you here today. Um, so following the presentation of Rupa, uh, I think there will be a lot of thoughts and, and yeah, uh, maybe even questions on how this lack of representation leads to even usually uh, leaving minorities and underrepresented groups behind. In the light of COVID-19, as it has been shown in other pandemics, and as Rupa was so nicely saying, the tyranny of the urgent, so diversity and inclusion is somehow like a secondary thing. And Rupa was mentioning the different voices, or maybe not so different, that have been heard during this pandemic. So I would like to ask some of our, uh, well, our panelists to think what have been the voices that you have been hearing during this pandemic? And with voices, we were talking about global health leadership in your, in your national context and, and how power has influenced this. And yeah, sorry for that. <laughs> okay, so as we were saying, let's, let's reflect. And I would like to, to open the floor directly to your panelists. Um, you can give me a sign if you maybe just raise your hand if you want to say something on, on your own reflections regarding the diverse or not so diverse voices that we've been hearing during the COVID-19 response. Who wants to go first? Sarah, I can start. Movement? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Hi, good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for having me. Um, I just want to echo what Rupa said um, about, the, you know, just the fact that um, this group is talking about these issues is, is, is really great. Um, and thank you for providing space to have these conversations. Um, in, in terms of representation in the COVID-19 response, what we're actually seeing is that, um, you know, as Rupa mentioned, about 70% of the health workforce um, are women. Um, you know, and so uh, what, what, what we actually have is people who are on the front lines, um, you know, who are actually providing the care, who are actually seeing the realities um, you know, who, who are not represented in this, you know, in panels, on, in media, in global decision making. Um, and then on the flip side, um, you're also seeing, um, you know, people from underrepresented groups, um, uh, you know, who are, who are the majority of frontline workers. Um, and, and, and so, you know, you're, you're essentially seeing this discrepancy in terms of who is actually represented um, you know, on not, not only on the front lines of, of care, but on the front lines of, um, of across all sectors who are primarily being affected um, and who are at greater risk for exposure of, um, you know, to, to COVID-19. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we, we see this, this, um, this gender burden, um, but we're also seeing this racial burden. Um, and I can speak to the United States, um, you know, because I'm, I'm American, that, um, you know, African-Americans, and also um, Hispanic Americans are um, overrepresented um, in terms of, uh, you know, COVID-19 burden. And so, um, you know, when, when you see this overrepresentation, um, you know, it, it essentially reflects that reality that 
um, you know, the 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 front line uh, is essentially not um, not not mirroring what 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 you're seeing on television, what you're seeing in decision making bodies. Um, and so at Women in Global Health, we we have really tried to um, narrow that um, narrow that divide and, uh, you know, really try to bring the local reality to global level decision making um, so that, um, you know, essentially policies reflect, um, you know, the diverse populations that it aims to serve. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, Afrinish, go ahead. Yeah, first, I would like to really to thank you and all the team of Diversity and Inclusion Network for having me here and uh, giving me this such great an opportunity to talk to a group of wonderful people on this important topic. Uh, to begin with, I must say that COVID-19 has brought a very difficult situation for every one of us. Like uh, we have faced something unexpected and it is uh, something like uh, difficult to control. And uh, depending upon the different countries, uh, we have seen different strategies and we have seen different adaptations depending upon the resources that they have. So um, coming towards a different perspective, like from the leadership criteria and from the other perspective, I will go one by one. If we talk about the leaderships, uh, I must say that leadership always matters a lot uh, in changing or redefining the shape of the organization and how the organization, organization is supposed to move. So, uh, the, uh, but majorly the decision of the leaders, they are affected by a number of things. Um, um, most mainly it will be the political elements. They can be any other uh, resource elements and there can be a number of things that, uh, that define the decision of the leaders. Uh, so uh, they, uh, leaders, like I must say, they, are, they have undergone a lot of pressure. They are supposed to do two different things. They are supposed to achieve the objectives. And in terms of the COVID-19, they are supposed to do the management. But uh, pr 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 parallelly, they have to do the uplift the morale of their uh, working force. So it's kind of an ongoing process, COVID-19, and there are a lot of tiring moments and changing strategies. So they have to go along with it. C considering from my country perspective, uh, we belong to a developing country and we have faced a different kind of a situation over here. And there's a changing decision by the government depending upon the load of the cases that we are seeing. And this has led to uh, uh, different kind of scenarios that we are seeing uh, in the management of COVID-19. Like for the decision about the smart lockdowns, decision about the social distancing and different uh, varying about the PPEs. Uh, so uh, from our country's perspective, this has been a very difficult situation for the leaders. Uh, but I must say that if a leader, if he, if he or she, if they believe in the power of the woman, uh, I must say they can make use of their expertise in a very tactful way. Um, I can give you my example. I'm a woman working in a developing country and uh, many of the people who know me, I have been given a great opportunity to work. I was a part of a rapid response team in my country for tackling this COVID-19. I was engaged at the point of entries, uh, like at the three international airports in the country to, uh, to train the teams uh, doing the simulation exercises. So it's the leadership can uh, do a number of wonders if they look from a holistic approach and uh, they, uh, they really want to bring some change in the society. And believe me, leadership is like an inborn trait, either is a male or is a female. If you have it, it is going to show up. And the uh, other area that I really want to highlight about the experts, uh, what we have seen from the experts point of view, so uh, uh, from this perspective, I can re not really say that it's the gender-based kind of a decision based on the experts. Either it's a male or a female, men or a woman. They have, if they have the knowledge, if they have the management skills, they are able to uh, handle the situation in a quite a good manner. Uh, but unfortunate is, uh, is, is the situation, the people of, uh, the, people of the country. They, they have to face uh, not only the consequences of the disease, but they also face the ill management system or the bad managed system. And the other area that I really want to highlight about the media, the role of the media that we have seen in this global pandemic uh, from our country's perspective, um, it's again, uh, if you talk about, if you try to correlate it with the gender equality, um, yes, it does matters. Um, but media has played a very good role in our country uh, in bringing the awareness among the masses. And uh, I must say like uh, 75 to 80% of the knowledge that we are seeing on the media, it's like, it's quite authenticated. And there are a number of the people who believe in that uh, knowledge that is provided. But uh, still we see many gaps. 
there are many uh, faces or the people who are not uh, disseminating the right knowledge. Uh, so this is my perspective from the different angles. And thank you. Great. Thanks, Afrinish. Yes, Margaret. Yeah, thank you very much. And hi, Rupa. Um, let me say thank you to Rupa and her team. I, I happen to be one of the recipients of the um, Heroines of Health Award. Yeah. So thank you um, to all of you. But taking on from where um, Afrinish um, spoke, um, the, the situations in developing countries appear to be the same across um, all over. Um, talking from the perspective of Ghana, um, we have females representing about 51% of our entire population. And we have very strong women uh, with strong voices who talk about gender and ensuring equality, equity in the country. But in the recent 2017 Global Gender Gap Report, Ghana ranked 112 out of 144 countries for gender index in political empowerment. So when you are talking about leadership and decision making at the highest level, um, it's not that equal. I mean, I remember with this particular government, for those of you who were at um, uh, the Women's Conference in Vancouver, you remember our president was in serious trouble for saying that our women are not standing up to the task. Um, but the issue, <laughs> and he was really put on the spot by the media and by everybody. He had actually tried to ensure um, a greater representation of women in parliament and women in leadership positions, but somehow it didn't turn out as was expected. Currently, we have just about 12% of ministerial positions held by women, really right now. But when it comes to COVID, um, the whole enterprise is led by the presidency, all right? And then the president has put measures in, in place such that you have people from different ministries, departments, and agencies coming together to form the team to tackle the issues. Now, um, when you look at the different ministries, you find out that, like my colleague said earlier on, it's not a matter of whether you are a male or female, but the person who occupies the position who is brought on board to be able to discuss the issues. Now, I kind of tried to do a breakdown of the different ministries and the people who are leading. And it was quite interesting. So if you take, for instance, the, the Ministry of Health and the Ghana Health Service, you have quite a few men who are leading, but you also have strong women in the background who have come up and have been called up um, during TV programs to be able to talk passionately about what is going on and making very strong statements about the need to ensure that there's proper representation um, in whatever goes on. So you take the Food and Drugs Authority and it is headed by a woman. Um, she's ensuring that um, standards are set properly for locally produced um, uh, sanitizers and, and face masks. You take uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, it is led by a woman. Um, we are supposed to be sorting out issues about closing of the borders and ensuring that people don't come in and go out. Um, ensuring that people in other countries who are locked out there are kept safe and are comforted is led by a woman. Then we have the Ministry of Gender and Social Protection led by a woman, ensuring that um, our, our female porters and people with disability are treated very well and are catered for in these difficult times. And then also you find out that when there was the lockdown, you had the market women who came out strongly to say there's no way that they can comply with some of these things because they, they actually depend on what they sell on a daily basis to be able to take care of their families. You know? So you, you had these voices coming out and with Ghana, we have the private media where people are allowed to speak. You know? And so there was a lot of um, media presence. There was a lot of attention paid to some of these people to be able to speak up. So you have the formal sectors, yes, largely headed by men, but when it comes to COVID and some of the decisions that are taken, you find out that some of the ministries and departments have strong women leading these institutions and they have actually made quite a bit of noise to ensure that the voices of the people who matter um, are heard. Um, we've talked about our health workers, yes, mothers and wives who already have complex lives trying to deal with serving people and then coming home and not being able to serve. 
something which they are used to already. So it creates quite a complex um, situation in there. One of the strong voices that the president had um, brought to bear is the voices of our queen mothers. Um, in Ghana, when you look at our traditional political structure, you have the chiefs and then you have the queen mothers who are also important decision makers at the lowest level, at the community level. And these people have been engaged to be able to do things. We still have quite a number of men out there who are speaking, but I think that so far, we have heard quite a few voices of the women out there who have tried to make a change. Indeed, the chair of the COVID fund is our former attorney general, a very strong woman. So she's in charge of the COVID fund, ensuring that funds are put in place properly and supposed to be used for the right things. Let me pause here for now. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think it, it's really good to hear, you know, we need to discuss about challenges, but also about positive examples. So thanks, Margaret, for that. Who wants to follow on this, maybe building on, on the previous reflections? Fredros, I see you nodding. Does that mean you want to go for it? Thank you, Carmen. Um, I, I, I think what I should say right now is that, yes, we are facing quite a number of challenges uh, in, uh, with the, in the question of diversity in global health. But what is also important to understand is that there's um, hundreds of people, uh, thousands of people around the world uh, who realize that this is a problem and want to make it better. And I'm hopeful uh, that a platform such as uh, the Women in Global Health or the Diversity Inclusion Network can serve to elevate these voices so that when we wake up in the morning, we are not hearing only the bad news but also the beautiful things uh, that is happening. Um, it is incredible just how um, strong uh, uh, some of these negative forces can be. Uh, and yet uh, many of us have uh, our testament to the beautiful things that can come out of global health if done properly. And uh, when you still had the videos on, uh, I could see quite a diversity and I was thinking, well, this is really what global health uh, should look like. Uh, and I think that is something that we can magnify. Uh, secondly, I, I just want to emphasize that, uh, you know, from a, again, from a diversity perspective, global health really should be global health. Uh, it should be global. Um, and and as, as we always say, uh, you know, the problem of Djibouti is very much a problem of Chad, and it's very much a problem of Mozambique. And by extension, it's very much a problem of India and the United States. So people who practice in global health uh, should realize from the start that global health actually should be global health. Uh, and, and that means, therefore, that participants must not be unnecessarily nationalistic. And uh, they might not, they must not have any, um, you know, a desire to promote a certain race or certain creed or uh, certain factions. They must realize from the start that they are entering a field that by its very nature is global. Uh, and uh, uh, the new coronavirus uh, emphasizes the point uh, that uh, uh, just like this should be, Viruses do not um, obey any, uh, they, do, they have diplomatic passports, they turn up and they don't require any visas. And so they need a similar approach uh, to address that. Uh, unfortunately, we have survived or we are living in a system now where the value systems promote unnecessary uh, competition, uh, where we are competing against rather than competing with. What this means is, you know, we have uh, some very strong players in global health who are very keen on amassing as much power as possible unto themselves and to, and, and to their institutions. Now, if it happens that these people are also the decision makers, then you kind of lopside uh, the whole thing. Uh, and I think that this is something that uh, together uh, global health society can crush, uh, uh, that we can return to a system where the value systems are more horizontal, uh, where people benefit and that the reward or the incentives that are associated with the participation 
are not purely about individual power or the number of publications that someone has or the number of grants that someone has, but really the contribution towards the number of lives saved or human life years uh, uh, protected. Mm. So, I, I mean, I, I have a, a few friends in, in the villages who have worked as midwives for many years and they, they are, if you ask them how many children have you delivered, they may say it's 10,000. But you know, they've never been in Geneva. Um, <laughs> and, and many of these things, I mean, they, they did them just by sheer willpower uh, to help. And I think those are major players. And uh, given that uh, we also have a quite a, a strong representation of our women colleagues today, this is a, a, an emphasis that uh, they should continue to place, especially on the, uh, the participation of lower cadre global health participants who are, are really helping us pull the weight uh, without ever fishing in Washington or, or Geneva. And lastly, uh, I would like to encourage the institutions that participate in this to focus more on structural issues rather than um, uh, you know, media interest or uh, witch hunt, uh, you know, sometimes when you raise these diversity issues, an institution sets up a commission and says, hey, uh, Professor so-and-so, um, you know, was accused of a racial slur or you know, I mean, these are, they are important as well. But I think institutions should focus on more structural aspects of this to really create an equal society. Uh, everybody is struggling. Our women colleagues are struggling with the uh, uh, gender uh, issues. Our gay colleagues are struggling with the desire to achieve a more rainbow nation. Uh, uh, black colleagues are uh, struggling with the desire to achieve a more equal, a colorless society. Uh, and this you achieve only by having a focus on more structural context rather than witch hunting and saying, oh, you know, uh, it's really difficult uh, to survive in a system where there are cameras all over you if you don't believe in the entire mission. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us have a, a, a very important mission here to improve people's health and well-being. And we can focus on that really strongly uh, by paying attention to the big picture uh, and really driving these forces going forward. Thank you very much, Carmen, and then the other speakers. I think I'll stop it there and, and I look forward to a great discussion today. Great, thanks, Fredros. Let me just give very briefly the word to Rupa and then we can move on. I will just briefly pause the conversation then so we have time to discuss with the groups and then we will, we will have enough time to continue. So Rupa, if I saw you wanted to say something in reaction. Very quickly, because I've had more than an ample time to share some of my reflections, but uh, Fredros, the point that you said uh, really resonates a lot. Um, a lot with women in global health that this needs to be a conversation on structural change. Too much time, too much um, efforts are often put to the individual, that the individual must uh, fix themselves, fit in, adopt the dominant culture, adopt the culture of, uh, of uh, you, you know, just one way of doing business, but um, and in reality is that organizations need to change and evolve and say, okay, women are working in the workplace. So what does that now look like? Okay, we have people from diverse backgrounds or with disability um, and how does how are we going to change our workplace environment or our global health community um, to be inclusive so that it leads to the smarter um, health um, solutions that we're looking for. So I think that really stood out and I think all of our groups like the diversity and um, inclusion network and women in global health and other groups that are working on these issues, the more we can make it a structural conversation and solution oriented conversation, I think that's where we'll have um, uh, traction. Uh, but it doesn't mean that at times that we shouldn't call it out because if we don't, then yeah. the bystander um, effect also takes place. But I think your message about uh, let's make sure we channel majority of our energy to structural is really, really um, a great one. So just wanted to re react to that. Great. Thanks. Thanks to all of you. So as I was saying, let's pause here. I'm sure our audience has now a lot of thoughts and, and reflections on this. So we will open to them. We give you uh, some, some minutes. Sarah will give more instructions on this. But the question we, we wanted you to, to address, or if you have other ones, is how has COVID-19 made all these inequities evident? And what are the effects or yeah in your own context thank you sarah welcome back everyone actually during this part of the panel 
it will be mainly Temi leading the discussion. So Temi, I'm here to support, but over to you. Thank you so much, Carmen. Um, I was able to up into um, a breakout room to just hear the conversation and I got some feedback from Catherine with regards to the question that was posed. Um, and she raised concerns because she works directly with um, community healthcare workers. And she raised concerns about how they have had to bear the burden of the inequalities that have been posed in our society. And one of such instances was where they, they do not have adequate protective um, gears for them to do their job and they're not well compensated. So I'd like to put the question forward to um, Afrenish. What do you think are the, moving forward, because this has become so evident during this time now as a pandemic, moving forward, uh, what are the measures we need to put in place to make sure such things are not repeated, to make sure that the pe people we consider essential workers, the people that we consider front frontline workers are well protected and are well equipped and are well compensated for the troubles that they go through to make sure that the community is still standing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Temi, for this very good question. And uh, yeah, it's like, uh, uh, if, if I look at this question, uh, it can be at the different uh, point from the different points of view. If we talk about the institutions, then it's the responsibility of the institutions to look at the safety and the uh, safety of their, uh, uh, you can say, the employees. And uh, it's not, or not only the male or the female. Uh, I can give you a very good example at my institute that uh, we are, uh, we, I work at National Institute of Health in Pakistan. And uh, here I, uh, there are a number of the male and the female uh, employees over here. And due to this COVID are more than 25 uh, uh, persons they have, they got infected with COVID. But the same uh, safety measures, or you can see the same protocols, same treatment, they have, they, it was suggested by our director to take care of all the persons who are uh, affected by the COVID. So it's like, uh, if you give, uh, encourage the, uh, your employees, if you give, give them uh, a sense of security about their job, if you give them sense of uh, security in terms of providing them the PPEs, uh, then they are able to work in a very good environment. So the environment matters a lot. And uh, from the community perspective, yes, uh, it's very important to have a very encouraging environment all across the uh, country or all across the environment. People should be not, uh, should uh, overcome this negative mind, uh, mindset towards this thing, or you can say the stigma associated with this thing, either it's a male or a female. Uh, so collective approach is required. Uh, the encouragement at every level, at every tier is required. Everyone is going through a tough situation. So that needs to be a considered as a collective approach to overcome this difficulty. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for taking that. Um, Rupa, you have something to say? Yeah, I do, because uh, this is something we work very closely um, uh, together with uh, the World Health Organization. We co-chair, and, and for all of you that are uh, specifically keen to work on gender equity in the health workforce, we co-chair a hub called Gender Equity Hub with the World Health Organization, where we look at all health workers, um, and, uh, and especially the point that Catherine is talking about, community health workers is one we are hearing especially some pretty, um, uh, I think the only word I can really use is like horrific stories of um, what they're facing at the front line all, all around the world and um, not being compensated, facing violence now that communities are um, you know, being hit economically, there's food security issues. And the community health workers are literally walking door to door, do not have physical protective equipment, and they don't have um, any social protection for salary because they're not considered to be part of the health system. They don't count. Um, they, and so this whole informal culture in the health sector is actually what we say is creates a house of cards that comes tumbling down and we're seeing that play itself out. So I think for all of us that are talking about um, doing work on stronger health systems, resilient health systems, systems, anything on health systems, we must factor in that um, community health workers provide such critical care, essential services, but if we don't count them in the formal labor and support them formally, um, you know, we're going to be setting all of the entire world up for failure. So really wanted to say this is um, a very critical point. Thanks. Yes. 
Thank you very much for your input, Rupa. Um, we have another question here from Gertrude. Um, it's about global health and addressing people with disability because it's like during times like this, they are not quite considered. They are put at the end. It's they're like an afterthought, the people with disabilities. It's all um, with the overwhelming issues and having no physical protection. This needs to be addressed. Um, Fedris, would you like to um, contribute to this? No, actually, I think I, I would rather we pass this question to Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but before I launch in, in, yeah. into that, um, I was quite intrigued by the issues that were raised earlier on with regards to PPEs and protection um, of our, our frontline work, um, health workers. You know, it, it, it comes back to the issue of policies and the implementation of policies um, at the highest level. Uh, and we talked about structural issues um, earlier on. So for instance, in Ghana, there's the policy about the fact that all frontline health workers, all those who are out there um, trying to support the system are given the PPEs. Sometimes you hear stories about the fact that it has left the national level to the regional level, but never arrived at the district or at the community level. And health systems all over have been struggling with this supply chain, whether it is um, vaccines, whether it is other logistics for delivering of services. And we are seeing it playing back during this um, COVID era. So the issue of policies, yes, it has been announced, it has been said, it has been supplied, but what is blocking it from reaching the people who need it to be able to use for their services? The second thing is the issue of um, people being exposed and the pushback they are getting and who gives them the kind of protection. So for those who are doing the contact tracing in Ghana, we've been doing quite a lot of it. Now, as soon as the issues of stigma started coming in, whenever these workers went to the homes, people didn't want to see them. They are receiving threats that they are going to be shot when they come to the homes. And quite a number of them are women. And so they are even scared of going back to do the tracing and the testing. Uh, some of them call some of these households and say, you are due for your second test. And they are told, never call me again. You know, So there has been a huge outcry about who supports these people who are out there facing the issues directly, but not getting the kind of support that they need to be able to um, address, address those issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that. Um, Afranish, looks like you have your hand up. The floor is yours. You're muted, friend. Yeah, sorry. It's like a, a very good question posed by uh, by a member, by a participant. I really want to highlight this thing over here. This pandemic has clearly showed the preparedness at every level, uh, at every country. That what are what have we prepared over the time, and what are the health system we're doing, and uh, at the time of emergencies, you see the outcome. And uh, it's not only the uh, uh, countries with the fragile health system, it's countries with the very strong health system, they are suffering. So uh, this is the time that needs that we need to stick together again and redefine and reshape the strategies towards the health systems. Either it is including the, the women in, at, a, at the equal leadership level uh, to this uh, strategy or development uh, scale, or either it is considering a from different, different perspective, like it's a, uh, it's a maternal or child health, either it is disability. So that needs to be considered. And that this pandemic has clearly shown our, the, the, we have, this is all about the unintended consequences of this uh, pandemic that we are seeing. Uh, we are suffering, everybody's going through a lot of many problems, like the, just discuss about the role of the PPEs. Uh, so this needs to be again, rethink, redefine and reshape the, your strategies uh, about the health system to overcome any uh, menace if we see uh, any future pandemic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Afranish. Um, we have another question yeah. here from Dana Quobes. Um, can I just okay. respond to, can I just respond to the previous question? Um, okay. You know, I think it's, it's, it's really important to talk about um, who is involved in, in the design of health systems. Um, so, you know, the fact that community health workers are not in the labor force um, or, or in the formal labor force to begin with um, is a fundamental flaw 
in the design of um, you know health systems at the country level, um, you know, and the fact that uh, you know they're 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 majority women, um, you know, and that they're 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 facing uh, you know a, a lot of these really unsafe working conditions, um, you know, I think that that really speaks to the fact that we need um, you know within ministries of health, um, but also within ministries of of labor and ministries of finance, um, you know, we need diverse representation. We need women from these communities, um, you know, that 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 are actually facing these issues, um, you know, for in, in order for it to be brought into uh, policy and decision making, um, you know. So I think that that point really just can't be emphasized enough that you know even even before we we get to um, you know developing task forces for um, you know health emergencies, we we need to be designing our health systems uh, with the building blocks in place that that incorporate diverse perspectives um, in, in in order to reflect the communities that they serve. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I'd like to pose the next question to Ropa, and this one's from Daniel Coves. He said there has been quite a lot of discussion of female leadership and success um, during this, um, the, the successful approach during the COVID-19. What are the elements of success from your perspective? Uh, so I think there's two parts to the question that, that, that I see as success. One is the leadership style and what is being um, you know, said about uh, how women specifically are approaching um, COVID-19. And uh, I want to you know, say that this is uh, clearly with the notion that we are uh, all being um, raised and, and in a gendered society. So there are certain gender roles and norms that um, have shaped how leadership is perceived and how uh, women are um, leading and how men are leading as well. So there's a lot of gender norms and roles that shape leadership styles. But what we have been seeing in, um, in any of the sort of quick analysis that's been done, mainly in mainstream media, looking at leadership styles of how women are talking about COVID-19 and what kind of response they've have, they've shown a lot more collaborative approach, um, clearer communication, decisive decision decision making. Um, and that has really helped in, um, in, in building trust in their communities. Um, so that's been a big part of, I think, the success part of, of the response. So what is, uh, I think, really critical to have a successful response is definitely you doing evidence guided decision making. Um, we are hearing uh, recommendations from WHO exactly on what that is. Uh, but as we know that, uh, that egos tend to get in the way, uh, and uh, uh, the a pandemic has become politicized to the extent that evidence is not necessarily the way that decisions are necessarily being made. So we are seeing the ramifications of that. But women leaders in general um, are uh, what we're seeing is they're they're looking at the evidence, they're having clear communication. And what success looks like is if you do have are using evidence guided approach, having strong communication, trust in your community, and your community is trusting you. Um, those are all aspects um, of, of really having success. And of course, you know, the, the, uh, for from a technical sense, it is really about uh, ensuring that we are flattening the curve, uh, reaching, uh, re making sure we're uh, reaching the hardest to reach people. Um, so we can't just look at numbers on their own, but are we um, reaching a, a, those communities that are from underprivileged backgrounds, lower socioeconomic status, or racial minorities? And those things um, we really have to make sure we're very deliberate about. And so success also includes um, that intersectionality approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I saw yes, a question sir. actually uh, about, um, you know, are, are, are we actually tracking uh, these things? I think um, Pat Hughes had actually asked a, a question, um, which I think is an important one. And I think, um, you know, really it, it just speaks to the fact that we need networks. We need, um, you know, global networks that are, that are looking at what's actually going on, um, you know, at, at the local levels. And so, you know, really, I think uh, with the Women in Global Health Network of chapters, um, you know, who have actually uh, built uh, COVID-19 and uh, gender task forces, um, you know, to, to look at these issues. So, um, you know, what, what, are, what, are, what is actually being tracked? Um, you know, what, what, what is actually going on at that level? Um, you know, just in terms of, um, you know, not, not only the response itself, um, but, but, but how that data is being collected, um, you know, and, and, and also, um, you know, we're, we're, we're having groups actually tracking um, what's being said and how the pandemic is being communicated. Um, you know, so we're, we're starting to do some of that analysis now, um, you know, but it, it's, it's very difficult to do that, um, you know, un unless we actually look at 
what's what's going on at the country level, but also what's going on at the local levels. Um, one example I'll I'll give of this is um, of of a leader, uh, a, a global health leader in um, in uh, Kerala, um, in India. Um, you know, she she actually was able to um, you know to to lead the response uh, locally, um, and she was able to you know very effectively communicate. Um, you know, with, 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 within the community, um, you know, uh, uh, safer, um, safer practices to, um, you know, prevent the spread of COVID-19. She was able to, um, you know, adequately, um, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, ensure a cross sectoral response, um, you know, so being able to look at, you know, not only the, the country level, but also what's going on at the local level, um, you know, and, and, and taking lessons from there as well. Um, so a, a lot of our chapters are doing this and, um, you know, in, in, in India, for example, um, also in, in Cameroon, um, in, in, in Norway, we have chapters who are, are looking at this data. Thank you very much for your input, Sarah. Um, there is a question here for Frenish. It says, often we hear women need to be prepared to take part in higher level jobs. Do you think it is more of an issue on women not being ready to take the lead or the systems not ready to take women in leadership positions? <laughs> it's a very good question, but yeah. I want to pose the question in a very different way. Uh, this is, uh, let me read it. It's, it says, often we hear women need to be prepared. Why do not we hear, often we hear men need to be prepared to take part in higher level jobs. It's nothing like with yeah. the preparation. I, I must tell you one thing, leadership is a trait. Either it's a male or it's a female. It's a man or a woman. If you have this trait in you to lead, to, uh, to understand uh, at a, from a holistic approach, then you are a leader. And one biggest thing, being a Muslim, I totally believe in this thing that we have learned a lot from our leader. Leader needs to be humble. Leader needs to be like uh, whenever some responsibility given to him, he should be more responsible. So there are certain traits that are confined with this term leadership. So it's not the men or women that needs to be trained to become a leader. And uh, other good thing, uh, I must tell you, you should, everyone should have a mentor in his life. Either it's a man or a woman. Mentor gives you a right direction. And the, if you, you will be blessed if you find a very good mentor in your life. I am blessed. I have a very good mentor in my life. It's Journal Amir Ikram. I am open to say this thing. And he's the person behind me and pushing me, encouraging me, and putting me in different difficult situations as well. He used to say this thing to me. I finished. I'm going to put you in a difficult situation. And this is going to make you more hard and it, this is going to make you more learned. So it's not like this, the, the mentor understands you, he sees the potential in you and then he or she makes you to go to that level of leadership or the higher post. And let me give you a very good example of uh, Prime Minister of New Zealand. She is just 37 or 38 years of old age and uh, see how good she is. She is just a young lady and it's a trait. It's not like uh, you are supposed to learn. And uh, this question can be posed either way. So think beyond men and women, think uh, on a larger scale. Thank you. Yeah. I also just wanted to add to that, that the, the, I mean, the, the fact that, um, you know, we, we don't actually have um, decent working conditions for women, um, you know, within health systems and, and within structures. Um, you know, we, we need paid family leave. Um, you know, we, we, we need to ensure that, that, that systems uh, within health are set up, um, you know, to, to retain women, um, you know, because uh, un unless we actually have, um, you know, systems that are, that, that are, that are set up uh, for, for women to lead and for women to, um, you know, uh, uh, stay in these positions, um, we'll continue to see, uh, you know, the, the, um, the, the inequalities persist. Um, so it's less about um, you know, preparing women and more about preparing the systems uh, to be able to uh, support the women in, in their roles uh, within health. And uh, uh, Temi, I'd like to actually, uh, uh, I know we're in a fishbowl, so I guess I get to challenge a little bit, uh, but I, I'm curious to hear Fredros's perspective on this as well. Because, um, uh, you know, you talked about structural aspects and this is really meant to be a conversation for, for all genders. So I, I don't know if I am allowed to do that, Temi. But... Yes, absolutely. Go for it. Yeah, absolutely. Fredros, <laughs> uh, who, who am I to speak for women? <laughs> but you know what? I think we have a duty to do that. Uh, and so we must. Um, and it revolves around, in my opinion, the concept of risk and respect. 
a lesson I learned uh, from a friend of mine from uh, Senegal, actually. Uh, uh, Sierra Leone. And the idea that, you know, if we uh, take some risk on some persons, they then have an opportunity to demonstrate something that they would otherwise not have demonstrated if we didn't take that risk in the first place. The second point is that, you know, even if you have someone at the top as the team leader, there's got to be a support structure around them to ensure that they are successful. And this is something that an institution can do to create a support structure for whoever is at the top. And this then allows us to create, to, to implement, uh, to take some risks on females, for example, and say, you are the boss. Well, you are the leader, let's say so. And here is the support structure to ensure that you can do your job. This is the structural thing that an institution can do. It happens, unfortunately, uh, that even though global health has a lot of women, uh, the leadership of global health doesn't have many women. But I think there is an opportunity in global health purely based on the fact that there's just already, compared to other uh, sectors, already quite a lot of women in global health. They just happen to be working at the lower levels. This is an advantage that we can take uh, and promote uh, some of these females uh, to, be, to be the leaders. Uh, if we rely on history and, and, and uh, traditional uh, development opportunities, you will realize that back in the 70s and 80s across the world, not just in Africa, uh, but also in the United States and India and elsewhere, women were underrepresented. So if you have a leadership structure that depends on age, a leadership structure that says you must also be the oldest, then naturally you will end up with men at the top. But you see, you can take risks on some younger people. And in the younger cadre, you have a lot more women finishing med school, a lot more women uh, with PhDs, a lot more women uh, 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 entering the workforce at, at early ages. And you can take uh, uh, risks here and have some very young women to take the leadership and then create a support structure around them uh, to just say, yeah, it's okay to make some mistakes, but the system is here really uh, to protect you. And, and to, to provide the guidance. And then in that case, you can have, you know, in-service training where necessary, most importantly, uh, mentorship programs, not just within your institution, but even in places where you can borrow. And the Diversity and Inclusion Network is a perfect example of that, where even if people are not from CCTPH, you know, they can offer a mentorship to institutions from around the world uh, where women are struggling to take leadership in their own institutions just because there's no other women around them. And I think that's an opportunity that we can use going forward. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rupa. And congratulations, by the way, on the work that uh, your organization is already uh, uh, doing uh, analyzing, for example, the leadership efforts by women around the world. It's difficult to be non-biased in this case because you're a woman organization and you're trying to check whether women are doing a better job than men. Uh, uh, someone can already predict your conclusion, but I think it's obvious around the world already. Uh, and, and you should be very, <laughs> uh, very proud to say that if that is the finding that you, you get at the end. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Th thanks. And, uh, I, and I did put you on the hot seat, um, but I think, you know, that point of about uh, really it's about the leadership style and and do we support all leaders and, and, the, and the bias is that very much we don't support women leaders as much so I think that your point of you know creating those enabling environments was really key uh, thanks Temi for letting me <laughs> kind of no, <laughs> swoop in no a little worries. I'm glad you did <laughs> so I'm gonna hand over to Carmen because she has stepped in now yes <laughs> sorry you infiltrated here so I'm really sorry to interrupt this really exciting and fascinating conversation. We are slowly heading to the end, but before we do that, we would like to encourage all our speakers as well as our audience to reflect on, you know, we've been discussing a lot about structures and systems, and I fully agree that it's not on the individual level. We need to challenge all these um, platforms and, and structures that are in place that pose so many barriers to so many people, this be women or all the other groups that we've been mentioning today. So before we close, I would like to give the voice to each one of our panelists to think, you know, on, on your individual level, on each, each one of our individual level, what can we do to challenge these structures, to challenge the status quo? And what would be 
that that called that so-called 15 percent that each one of us has to to change things so i would hand over to the first one that dares to go for it and to our zoom uh, participants please write down in zoom your thoughts it's really fascinating to see so many questions and discussions going on in the chat so keep it up while our panelists have their last word thank you very much who wants to go first Margaret, you've been quiet for a while. Do you have some thoughts here? <laughs> I, I spoke earlier, but but anyway, thank you very much, um, Carmen, for that. You know, um, I was reflecting around the discussions we are having, gender, um, equity, global health, looking into the future and what can be done. And I'm asking myself, you know, the terminology has changed over the years. You've had international health, global health. And then I, I keep asking myself, whose problem is it, you know? Um, you read papers and documents and, and you, you realize that when it comes to global health uh, programs, um, they are kind of still overwhelmingly um, based in the world's richest countries, if, let me put it that way. And then the, the efforts are directed at the world's um, poorest, but it's really not surprising because we still uh, live in a world with very vast health inequities between developed and developing um, countries. So then I pose the question again, so if the Global South were supported by our governments to conduct research and implement health programs on something like non-communicable diseases, which are not really tropical diseases, but are creeping back into our systems, and we had the opportunity to go and institute programs in the Global North, will it still be international health or global health? So putting it the other way around, because currently it is from the north to the south and it becomes global health, the structures, the systems. But if we turn it the other way around, will the systems and the structures still be the same to be able to develop uh, things like that? Um, we, we also know that the social determinants of health, which have been assumed to have an impact um, only in the global south, are now being shown to play um, a role in disease outcomes in the north. Look at Ebola. You would have thought it was only in Africa, but then you had it outside, out there. And so measures had to be put in place to be able to take care of this. Look at what is happening with COVID. Um, you would think that the structures are in place to have people who are seriously sick, but then you find out that it's breaking down and in Africa, things are different. So um, anyway, while acknowledging the fact that one size does not fit all, um, context is important and we need to be able to have more bi-directional exchange of public health knowledge and experience to be able to understand what the issues are and to be able to deal with them, whether they are structural things or whether they are more fluid things um, to be able to make a headway with the direction in which we are going with global health. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Margaret. Those were yeah, really great last remarks. Who wants to follow on your individual capacity? Mm -hmm. Sarah, do you want to go for it? Give it a go. Sure. Um, so, I mean, just just to wrap up, um, you know, one of the things that we spoke about in our breakout sessions um, was was the fact that um, there are policies from the top, um, you know, sort of sort of being um, being 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 pushed down um, to, to to the local levels uh, that are not based in reality. Um, so, you know, one example is the fact that, um, you know, we are, we're, we're asking for social distancing uh, during COVID-19, um, but there are many communities that are actually um, not able to do that because they live in, um, you know, slums that, that are crowded. Um, you know, a, a, a lot of the advice has been surrounding hand washing, um, you know, but there are still communities that don't have access to, um, you know, uh, clean, clean running water um, or soap. And so, you know, really, really, I think uh, Margaret's point was was hitting the head, the nail on the head, um, because we cannot actually have um, programs that are led by people who don't understand uh, the reality. So, you know, we we really need people in the driver's seat, um, you know, who reflect the diversity of the communities that they're looking to serve, um, you know, meaning that, uh, you know, the, the local realities are, are actually able to be reflected, um, you know, in, in, in decision making. And that can only happen with with representation. And we see that when women are actually in leadership roles, um, you know, women from all backgrounds are actually able, um, you know, to to um, you know, they they actually have a tendency to take diverse perspectives into account. Um, you know, so it, you know, if if I have to close with one thing, that that would be my point is that. 
um, you know, having having diverse backgrounds in the decision making um, seat, uh, you know, not not only in terms of gender, but but in terms of rec uh, uh, representation from lower and middle income countries, um, in terms of underrepresented groups with you know with within countries as well, um, you know, is is extremely important, and so. You know, one one way that we can do this um, is that you know we can examine our own organizations. We can look at our own teams. We can look at our boards. Um, you know, we can um, you know if uh, you know donor audiences are tuning in. Um, you know, look at the organizations that you're funding. Are they um, you know who are their leaders? Um, you know, is is there gender parity in in those um, you know in in the people leading those programs? Um, you know, so that's that's one place that we can start to ensure that you know when the next pandemic rolls around, um, you know that those fundamental systems and, and structures uh, that, that can actually support diversity are in place. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Afrinish, would you like to continue? Yeah, you're muted. Yeah, perfect. Uh, yeah, it's uh, at individual level. What can I suggest is like uh, there are a number of things that came up in my mind with this question. Like uh, I totally believe in this thing that uh, keep uh, you have we have to keep doing the work we have we, like uh, is if you want to bring some change uh, believe in yourself first thing is this is important that you have to believe in yourself that you can bring the change and with this belief you have to be very persistent and you have to be, uh, like you have to bear it for a longer period of time that uh, it may uh, you can achieve it like in a year you uh, you can achieve it like in five years we have a very good example of wgs Rupa in front of us that like it took us la her a longer time to bring the voice uh, on a on a you can say on a larger scale and uh, like we have to keep doing the work even if it is small and i believe in this thing it is going to show up sometime in your life and we have to keep uh, our voice raising uh, because we are facing a very insecure system. I am talking about system. It's not particularly a male or a female. And it's the system that we are facing. It's the community or it's the environment that we are facing. And we have to overcome it uh, by persistent work. The other thing I would suggest is like we have to find the balance between our work and the family. We, everyone uh, being a female or a male, we have kids, we have a family, we have to find that balance. And uh, the support from your family, uh, that is the biggest thing that you can get and that can help you in getting something in your life. Uh, because once, once you are satisfied with, with your life, uh, with your family, that their kids are happy, they are with your uh, husband and anything like this, then you are able to work and focus on your work and you can achieve something. And that support is much needed. And the last important thing that if you want to go to that position of leadership and you think that you want to be the leader of some higher institute, first you have to identify a very good traits of uh, leadership if they exist in you or not. The one big, big trait that I see is the selflessness. You have to think beyond yourself if you want to be the leader. Leader is always at the giving end. And it's very hard at times to be at that end. You have to uh, give a number of things and you are supposed to uh, be very generous to the people to achieve that position. Uh, that's it from my side. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Afrinish. Let me give quickly the word also to Fredros. What are your individual takeaways? No, just to thank uh, uh, Diversity and uh, Inclusion Network uh, and the Women in Global Health uh, groups for organizing this. Uh, congratulations. Um, what can we do going forward? Uh, if you are in global health uh, for the same mission uh, of improving people's health and well being, then that should be it. Uh, if you are in it uh, for uh, self satisfaction, uh, for power, um, or uh, grant funding, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you better get out of it. Um, uh, the status quo will not win the final war. Uh, and uh, so this is a struggle that will continue for many years. Um, and you never know what is gonna happen to end. But I think that there is a very beautiful part of global health that is a group of people who are very optimistic and who are tr struggling. Uh, to make it right. And this is a group of people of all shades. Uh, there's white people in there, black people in there, there's uh, every color in the middle, pink, yellow and everything. And they are all uh, struggling to get to get to the right end. 
Now we have to magnify those voices. Of course, there is also a group that are, is evidently uh, intending to maintain uh, the historical injustices. Uh, but I think uh, that group is gro going to be smaller and smaller as the younger people get into power. <clears throat> so we should not be naive to think that we, we're going to win this after the coronavirus and the current Black Lives Matter movement. I think uh, all of us need to really stay uh, focused on the, for the long term um, um, and, and borrow from the learnings of this justification, mutual learning for change. You can learn from everybody and, and create a, a, a better future. Lastly, a global health needs justice. Uh, and I think this is important, uh, justice and fairness. You can practice this at individual level. Uh, you can practice this uh, at your own institution. Uh, I know many of uh, <coughs> um, my uh, African colleagues uh, who after they get their PhDs, uh, they go back to the village and, and get a young lady who doesn't have a, a high school degree bring them to the city and these young women then become house housekeepers and, and take care of their children. And, and I, th I think this is as much of a slavery as it was in uh, 1800. So you've got to start from your own household, uh, uh, whether it's the caste system in India or whether it is the, uh, the, the racism in the US, I think all of us really have a responsibility to to do to do right. Uh, um, uh, global health needs uh, justice, and we're gonna fight it only if we struggle both from inside and uh, 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 outside. So thank you very much again, uh, guys, for for the excellent discussion today. And I'm really really encouraged to see that there is a united force uh, towards something much more beautiful than yesterday. Thank you very much. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Fredericks and. Last but definitely not least, we started with you and we finished with you, Rupa. Yes, and I and I will keep it short and sweet because I would really like to say I agree with all the panelists and really want us to say thank you so much to the Diversity Inclusion Network, but most importantly to all of the attendees that have tuned in, stayed with us to this end. And uh, my one uh, call to action to all of you is um, there's been so much shared today, uh, but if you can take this conversation beyond um, what we've been able to do today and into your own workplace, into your own home, into your own house household communities and just continue talking about diversity and inclusion. We really need um, these conversations to become uh, conversations that everybody sees as their business. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very, very much to all of you. It's been a really fantastic conversation and I I really think this has been just the beginning because I mean if you look at the at the chat of our Zoom as well as on our YouTube, there's been so many comments coming from from so many sides. Um, so yeah, this, this has been really a fantastic and as you Rupa were so nicely saying, I hope we can continue this conversation. This has only been the beginning of hopefully many conversations to continue. We would like from the DNI network to thank all those that have stayed a bit over time in Zoom, also on YouTube. Um, thanks for, for holding with us. And we will, we will stay connected for 10, 15 minutes. So, we encourage now everyone to turn off their cameras again. If you want to say any last comments, feedback on this session, you're all welcome to do so. And yes, let's continue this conversation. Thank you. Awesome.